still connected to their human existence. And so they still remember what being a mortal human was like, and it's easy for them in, in that way to still interact with human beings. Uh, because one of my own fascinations with vampires is the fact that they are on that sort of borderline between humanity and monstrosity, it was important for me that my vampires be able to keep one foot in the immortal world and one foot in the mortal world at the same time without seeming too disconnected. There's a practical side to that too, because if your if your food source is human blood and and you are not able to at least in some ways pass for you for human in a way that doesn't creep all your food source out, you're gonna have some problems, potentially. Um, and my vampires don't tend to have a red field running around doing their food procuring for them. So, so anyway, that's part of my thing. So if you watch like anything on Tabula about how the gut doctor tells you to like throw out that vegetable, basically after a really long binge of watching that video and hearing all about gut bacteria, I made vampires basically sentient gut bacteria. And by keeping it really scaled back and scientific, and lots of neurotoxins, because, well, we've discussed the other toxins, but by basically making their whole shtick be that they're kind of walking, missing drug creatures that sort of make everything around them hazy and you don't really know what's going on, they're basically just party boys who can fit in anywhere and no one remembers them, especially for those who know the book Steve. Gotta give a shout out to Steve on every panel. Um, but yeah, I think when you start scaling it back and focusing on science, it's a lot easier to do it modern. In fact, I had more trouble going back and talking about the history of like, well, how did it work? You're not really very epic, and then just sort of roll from there. Um, I think it's really important. And as I said, you try to keep the main vampires kind of the more younger and modern, because it's a lot easier when you're dealing with humans to make them relate. I think you have to have limitations because otherwise you have a mortal being and if they have no limitations, where is it? <coughs> Who cares about reading that? Like there's nothing no drama. Yeah, there's no drama. There has to be drama. Um, I like like my vampires do not go out in the sunlight because I find that creates a lot of problems if you're trying to tell a story and that for me is much more interesting than oh well, they can go out in sunlight. But no, they they have to conduct everything at night. Um, but I think if you don't have limitations, you know where's I really think that we need a panel on killing vampires with Parmesan cheese <laughs> <laughs> and on hallucinogenic vampire scenes. <laughs> <laughs> Next year's panel. <laughs> <laughs> the world building is one of the most fun parts for me. And it was the, uh, okay, so if we have these vampires and they aren't killing people, how many vampires are there in a given city of a certain size? And how many of them are killing people versus how many of them have found a more sustainable way to be? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have in, in, in one of the books when uh, an event happens and there is a change of authority in the city and suddenly their vampires are not allowed to kill humans then suddenly we have uh, the leader of the uh, chupacabra who everybody calls him Pop C because he is in charge of population control and he's like okay so you cannot stop killing this many people without telling me because things are set up for a 15% replacement rate, <laughs> and I have all these job postings in other cities, <laughs> and you can't do that. Now there's a housing shortage, and, <laughs> but, you know, and then, then the, the, the vampire who's tangentially in control, and then what do you do if a vampire, say, goes amok and kills 200 people in the street? Well, clearly, you don't want everybody to talk. Well, that's right. Um, one, one of my favorite characters to write is Greta. She is absolutely insane. Um, and people think it's because, <laughs> thank you, 
people think it's because she has an eating disorder. It's actually because you feed your largest form, which is why you don't turn into big things. <laughs> she turns into a very big thing. And as a result, she's hungry always. Um, but, you know, so then that's when the Major Scope comes in. And what is the price for uh, erasing everybody's memories and swapping out the news feed and, and all that? So that that was fun. And also it's like, why, does, why do you wind up running the strip club as a vampire? Well, because then you have, you know, ready, really, ready access to women of negotiable volume. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, in mine, uh, I mean, I think vampires are like people. There are some that are naturally good, and some that are not so good, or have ulterior motives, or have selfish reasons for wanting what they want. And so, the the organization they do have their own government system where they are separated into covens, which are smaller groups in each town. And each coven has a master who's a representative in a larger consortium. Um, back in the day, before. Um, you know, like they had all of this political thing. There was a lot of vampires that were just kind of doing their own thing, killing people willy-nilly, and kind of risking exposure for the group. And so they brought in this human group called Slayer Inc. And they said, hey, can you police the bad vampires? But lately, Slayer Inc. has been kind of overstepping its bounds and making its own rules and maybe like taking out some of the vampires that, you know, actually are good vampires. Uh, for example, they don't believe in children vampires. So if you're a child vampire, they will attempt to take you out even if you're a good person. Um, and so, you know, that kind of way, they have their own system and government and, and, and everything in place. And in the beginning books, I kind of just dwell more on individual players, you know, like the, the girls that get pulled into the vampire world. And if you're doing an eight book series, it starts widening out as you go. And I got really fascinated by all the politics. So the later books are much more dealing with the bigger pictures of this vampire society and how it all works. Well, one of the bigger restrictions on my vampires is, well, gee whiz, we're all playing by basically Bram Stoker rules. Uh, if you're a halfway decent vampire, you don't get, you know, horribly murdered by hardly a holy artifact. But if you're a schmuck, you're a toast. Um, but, so even, you know, vampires who want to be serial killers when they grow up, they have a serious problem of, you know, if you be, if you, you've been out of stay below the radar, otherwise, one, other vampires will take you out because you're attracting attention. We don't want that. Hey, we read the Jim Butcher Dresden file. Last board <laughs> down to two people for good reason. You know, this guy named Stoker, um, you know, who supposedly died in TV, but really the vampires got him. Um, and, you know, I also have, when things really hit the fan, and even the local vampires don't want to touch you, uh, that's when I have the Vatican Ninjas. Uh, they are armed with, yes, I have Vatican Ninjas. They are armed with throwing stars of David. We <laughs> 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 do a double for the Mossad vampire hunting team. We haven't gotten there yet, but I will. <laughs> you know, but, um, and I've even developed. All right, I mentioned the microbiology a few times. Uh, in real life, there are uh, the viruses that will help the host they infect. You know. Uh, Viruses in birds will infect the droppings, exposes insects to the virus, and the virus causes the ants to go higher, meaning the birds can get them. In the case of vampire uh, virus, they bite a human. Enough of the virus goes through the saliva to keep the, to strengthen the, the, the uh, human victim enough so that the victim will survive and the livestock will be intact. Generally, they will just have to drink lots of fluid. Um, although I did turn this into, yeah, uh, vampire bit a healthy person, didn't drink anything, still exposed to the vampire virus. So it's like, um, why, why am I now lifting 500 pound weights? <laughs> I, do, I struggled with 50 before. Is there something you would like to tell me? <laughs> so, yeah, there, there are plenty of limitations, and let's face it, um, the one thing my vampires would fear is exposure because, gee, you can't go out in daylight. All the vampire hunters start working in daylight, and, you know, they find you and they get burned down the place you're living in. Congratulations, you've got an instant sunroof. 
Have a nice day. <laughs> I just wanted to add one thing. I'm curious how many people here write vampires, want to write vampires, or that's why you're here. Awesome. Um, I think there's two things. One, I would say it's so much fun to create your world. Uh, and you can really do anything. You can create a world that is, has any rules that you want. Um, and as you can see from this panel, everyone has their own spin on it. Um, I do think probably blood drinking might be the one thing that defines a vampire in the genre. I don't know. I should probably be proven wrong. That would be one out there that they don't drink some kind of blood. But, um, you know, like, you can do anything. The key, however, is to be consistent, to lay down these rules and know them before you start your story. I was a new writer when I wrote Boys of Fight. It was one of my first books, and I just threw out some rules because it was supposed to be one book, you know? <laughs> it's eight books. And let me tell you, when you get to like six, seven, and eight, you're like, oh, why did I make that rule? That's so restricting. <laughs> like, I had this stupid thing where people could only, or vampires could only infect one person in their entire life. And I was like, uh, what am I supposed to do? I've written myself in a corner. So I was like, okay. <laughs> Well, that's what we just tell the noobs, and that's sort of more of a guideline than a rule. You know, like, I don't know what I so many things. So don't put too many rules in book one. Um, stay consistent with them, and, and make them make sense, because, you know, you don't have to go into them really, really detailed. Make sure the reader gets it, gets what the world is like, a concrete picture, and then you're going to be good, no matter what you make your vampire like. What she said. <laughs> okay, so we're at about 15 minutes. Um, till the end. So, um, who is familiar, anyone here familiar with Alicia Costa? She's an author who's sometimes on this track, mostly on the YA track, but she's around in a couple other places. She's amazing. If you're going to see her on the panel or read her books, definitely do it. She's awesome. She wrote um, the Dark Hunter Companion about the Cheryl and Kenyon vampires. Mm -hmm. um, she uh, does, along with some friends of hers, uh, does a traveling sideshow. Uh, which is basically a variety show uh, that is absolutely amazing. The room always fills up, so if you have complete time, look it up in your app, see what it is, see if you can make it over there and get there early. Um, it's hysterical. I go to it every year. It's absolutely amazing. Um, but she is giving, has given us some of her tote bags that has the Princess Elise's Traveling Slideshow, slideshow, slideshow um, logo on the front. And if you ask a question, you get to have one of these bags. So, I know you guys had questions anyway, but now you have a bonus. Um, so, who has a question for our authors? Let's go here in the front. Um, so, you kind of started touching on it, but it sounds like a lot of what you're writing about is a reaction to the cultural zeitgeist that already exists about vampires. So, besides the idea of mortals living amongst uh, mortals, because I've seen that with fairies too, what makes a vampire a vampire to the sense that the reader can understand it as part of that zeitgeist. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think with vampires, let's face it, they're all about desire. Fairies like mis to be mischievous, you know, werewolves, well, we won't even go there. <laughs> but um, I think with vampires, it's all about food and sex. It's very primal, it's a lot of desire, and everyone can relate to it. And we're all afraid of death. Like, be fair. So I think vampires, a lot of us go, because yeah, it's an easy target, but it's also really relatable. And it's a lot of fun, because you can go to sex, you can go to comedy, and it just makes sense. It's often, and not, not always, very glamorous. I think there's a glamour that surrounds vampires, and certainly people do it different ways, and they're not all glamorous vampires. But I do think that's part of the attraction for a lot of people, is this beautiful, glamorous, you know, inner, um, immortal being. And One, blood drinking, obviously, as we mentioned. Also, if, if you're going to have anything that even, anything in the vampire genre, because keep in mind there are multiple types of vampires out there. Uh, I, I hear Eastern Europeans have the Strega, not to be misconstrued with Strega, which are witches in Italy. So, bowels, they're a wonderful thing. Um, <laughs> but, at least as far as I'm, I know, I know with, my thing, one of the things I had to put in was, no matter how good the vampire is, no matter how good the vampire wants to be, there is going to be an internal predatory nature that they have to fight it, they have to give into it, but it has to be there. You know, uh, you will note Jim Butcher, you know, his best vampire is 
you know, uh, Thomas. But he's still a freaking predator. He's got it under control, though. Don't worry. Uh, that's why he's a hairdresser. Long story. But you got to have a predatory nature. Um, heck, I even made it into a bit of a joke because one of the taglines for my books is one is a bloodthirsty, heartless monster, the other is a vampire. <laughs> my question is, how do you deal with uh, these vampires going through like the changing morals of society? Because even with the young vampire, things in the 20th century have changed so much. Um, for the most part, if a vampire doesn't care about morals, the changing wars don't care. They just have to pretend. In fact, um, in some cases, with the more predatory, depending on your, no matter how you use the word predatory, vampires, uh, it's actually gotten easier over time. Oh, look, the miniskirt has come in. A great shot at the femoral artery. You don't even need to take the clothes off. Um, <laughs> with, you know, vampires who are, you know, trying to be as good as humanly possible, no matter how you want to parse that statement, um, they're not going to take any risks because, you know, especially if they like going to church or with God, we have to do a confession, I have to be really good, otherwise it's going to suck. Pun intended. I think in terms of having vampires deal with technology, it doesn't necessarily have to be any different from the way that humans, ordinary humans of different generations, deal with technology. I mean, you can look at the way an 80-year-old today interfaces with the internet, interfaces with smartphones and things like that. They don't understand them the same way a 20-something or a teenager understands them. And it can be the same way for vampires and humans. I think in terms of the world building with, with writing uh, paranormal or any sort of genre of fiction, it's easy to get bogged down with the world building and with the, the fact that you're writing about things that are different. Sometimes it's useful to bring things back to the common denominator of humanity uh, because we're all writing for human beings. So if you find yourself getting, getting kind of tied up in that sort of thing, think about you know just how Older people have trouble relating to younger people and technological shifts, and that applies. That can apply to vampires, and you can have techie vampires too. All vampires don't have to relate to things the same way, just like all humans don't relate to things all the same way. I think too that there's an acceptance that they are, you know, whether or not they want to accept or not, they are predators. So, in that, 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 yeah, that well, but also my vampires like I'm not a human, I'm something else. Because they accept that they may not like it. They may try to hide it, you know, because it makes them feel better. But vampires, I think, essentially, it goes back to what you said, it's sex and desire. It's a very self-centered worldview, and there's something. Let's all be honest. There's something appealing about being able to focus on just your desires. Well, and I think that also how your characters react to that um, is a great way to reveal something about them without actually having to spell it out to the reader. For example, uh, Dr. Fish, uh, one of the vampires that you see later in the series, he's a Jewish vampire and he understands that rabbinical law would allow him to consume whatever he needed to preserve his life, but he feels really bad about that. So living Jews would be able to drink fish blood if it was clearly labeled as fish blood. So that's all Dr. Fish drinks. And he has all these coffee mugs that say fish blood on, fish blood on them and it's accurate. And that's why everybody calls him Dr. Fish, even though that's not his real name. But it lets you know. Right? So here is a doctor, so clearly he wants to do no harm, so he's doing his little harm. Uh, really cheesy question, but um, at what age did y'all start really being interested in writing? <laughs> Hard in the middle, <laughs> but I've got this great other shiny idea that's a thousand times better. I'm gonna work on that. 
And I see that trap all the time um, in other people now. And it really takes a lot of discipline to write an entire book. Yeah. Started writing when I was four. I uh, heard a science fiction short story with a little stick figure pictures when I was four. Um, and then when I was 13, I published my first short story in Scholastic Magazine. It was pretty impressive to get $25 checks for a Epic for, yeah, <laughs> that was now it took a little bit longer for the, the novel thing to start happening, but I've been writing for a long time. Yeah. Total poetry, bad poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Is all poetry bad when you're 12 for 13? Yeah. The YA Craft is actually doing a juvenilia panel where people are reading either their fan fiction or, you know, writings from like when they were teenagers or whatever. And it's always really funny and embarrassing. So I'm on that. I forget what it is. I'll have to look at the app. But uh, yeah, it's a good time. It's very funny. Insert I have Argon jokes here. <laughs> Well, actually, it was put up by his werewolf great grandson, so it was a complete joke of likes to suck men off. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 